such a wonderful and beloved place. Um, among my many observations, I work on the late Victorian catalogue at the National Portrait Gallery. And as you heard, I've just recently curated a gallery display, a case display, to mark uh, Jane Morris's centenary. And Jane is probably more familiar to me as a pre raphaelite icon, actually, than as, in my view, equally importantly, Chatelain and eventual owner and preserver of Pearl's Got Money, which is the one that most of us know is. Quickly, Jane was born into poverty in Oxford in a back alley, uh, somewhere near this site. <coughs> um, this is the blue plaque unveiled by myself and the Lord Lieutenant in 2007. Her parents came from nearby villages um, outside Oxford, or rather near to Kelmscroft. Her mother from Alverscroft and her father from Stanton Harcourt. Um, and her father in Oxford worked as a stable man. And so from an unremarkable and very deprived background, childhood, emerged a very remarkable young woman. Just short of her 19th birthday, as in this earliest photograph on the left, uh, she met the young pre-Raphaelite painters who were then engaged at the end of their jovial campaign decorating the university debating chamber with scenes from the tales of King Arthur. And the leader of this group was Dante Gabriel Rossetti, bottom left, uh, who wanted a model for Guinevere and chose Jane, found Jane. But in the event, it was William Morris self-portrait top left, who uh, was left behind in Oxford, essentially painting Jane as La Belle Resort, and, um, and who transformed Jane from, um, in a sort of Cinderella fashion, um, into more or less into a princess from her, from her background. And in fact, there's a sort of hint that she was working as a housemaid, um, because at that age, a young woman would not have been idle or at school. She would have been out at work somewhere, we don't know. Um, <coughs> they married in 1859, settled first in London, then in Kent, where they had two daughters, and where Morris, Rossetti, Byrne Jones, and others founded the firm later known as Morris & Company. Um, and to manage the business, the Morrises, so that Morris could manage the business, they moved back into central London where Jane supervised the embroidery commissions as well as stitching many herself. So she had a very active part to play in the Morrison Company. <coughs> I'm very pleased that the NPG display is being re-shown more or less intact at, at Kelmscott later this summer. Um, Jane is, is is best known in her role as a pre-Raphaelite muse. She was cast as Persephone, Astarte, Pandora, and so on. And here she is in the famous Rossetti portrait of her that's now at the manor. It's a very fine, beautiful uh, piece. But for the MPG, I wished to display, to present rather a real-life Jane, with pictures of her family and friends, as in these from the sequence, famous sequence by Frederick Collier, showing, taken in 1874, showing the Morris and Byrne Jones families together in London. Um, so there they all are. You have to you have to work out who's who, but you can quite see that in the group photograph, the Morrises are seated on on the right, grouped together on the right, and the Byrne Jones is effectively on the left. Although one of the Morris daughters has. Margaret Burn Jones on her knee. And then on the, on the uh, photograph in between, the four children are posing um, in a rather unconventional shot, it must be said, a portrait of children for the time to show them perched in the tree. And there's a whole sequence of them in, in different poses. And not all of them, Phil Burn Jones has got his nose in his book, but uh, they're all in there. Now, <coughs> Jane's younger daughter. Followed her mother's career path in becoming a renowned embroidery and textiles practitioner, designer, and teacher at the Central School, particularly. But
But their elder daughter, Jenny, on the left, her life was tragically curtailed in her teens when she developed epilepsy, which was then untreatable. And Jane, at this point, became Jenny's primary carer. And I think this was Jane's unending grief and anxiety because Jenny could not be effectively left alone, so she had always to be accompanied. Each seizure, Jane said, was like a knife in my heart. And since they were always unpredictable, um, this was a very uh, distressing situation. Now, Jenny, Jenny was photographed on the left here at Helmscott. This is one of the rooms at Helmscott. And I'm guessing that it was in 1898 all, all suggestions gratefully received because actually we don't know. <coughs> James? Jane has an unfortunate reputation as a sulky and the bubble a silent invalid. It's actually derived from those fun facade drawings and, and pictures, not from her real self. Although you can see she had quite a somber aspect, but it's as if it's as if an actor or model has had to embody uh, the role that she's playing. So you mustn't be you mustn't read Jane's character from the very famous images of her, and that has overshadowed other aspects of her life, including her extensive friendships, which is one thing that. Display is exploring for. Now, portrait gallery displays, case displays, are drawn from works on paper within the permanent collection. So they're not, and if there's no loan works, and um, these are all um, works on paper in different media from the gallery's collection. And they include this fine drawing of Jane's close friend Rosalind Howard. Countess of Carlisle, drawn by her husband, the artist George Howard. And uh, Rosalind invited Jane, to, Jane and her daughters, firstly, to join her on a couple of extended visits in Italy, um, <coughs> when it was hoped that the climate might benefit Jane's condition. Sadly, it didn't. Um, and it's a very nice drawing of Rosalind, and it marks George Howard's importance, I think, as an artist, but also he, he, he was a semi-professional artist as well as being um, Earl of Carlisle, MP, then a peer, and trustee of the National Gallery and many other public um, missions. Is um, poet Algernon Swinburne, whom Jane first met in Oxford, at, you know, when they were in Oxford, and who remained a lifelong friend. After Swinburne gave up drink, which um, was rather necessary, she would visit him in his sober aspect in Putney when he insisted on reading his verses aloud whenever uh, they went. She reported, he's always rather difficult to follow as he puts so much action into his reading that things roll off the table making noises. <laughs> <laughs> All the same, we enjoy our visits. I think he really likes to see old friends. And this is a caricature of Vanity Fair by Carlo Pellegrini. Other close friends included, on the left, artist Marie Stillman, Maurice Bartley Stillman, seen here with her son Michael, um, who was a left and Maurice Bartley and Mrs. Stillman was a very close friend of Jane, particularly in the later uh, years of her life. And I think at Helmscott you, you will see one of Marie's drawings of the matter six or seven views that she did over the years of the Man of Watercolors, if you were there. And on the right are Jane's other friends, the Cobden sisters, Jane and Annie, whom she met up with in Siena one spring. And this was when Annie Cobden, Annie, Sa Annie Cobden became engaged to James Sanderson, who's the poet, the single poet in the group. Jane, of course, is the tour tallest one of them, and there's some debate as to whether <laughs> as to whether the woman on the left or the woman on the right are Jane or Annie. Um, I always 
assumed that the one on the left was Annie Crofton's arbiter because she's posing and, and James is holding her elbow. Mm -hmm. But there's some dispute about this. Um, Jane Crofton, if it is she on the right or on the left, was the first woman elected to the London County Council in 1888, although she was prevented from taking her seat. Um, James, Jane Morris supported her efforts, Crofton's efforts, although she was herself rather ambivalent about the suffrage and ab actively disliked the pankhursts at the end of her life who became rather noisy, she thought. <laughs> Politically, Jane didn't follow William Morris into the socialist movement, but she remained a staunch liberal and within the liberal tradition, a radical. Uh, she was, um, but she did share fully and support Morris's passions for fine craftsmanship and for architectural preservation. So that her, her contributions to the SPAB, um, although very almost invisible, are, were definitely part of her um, activities. Now, showing slides at this scale gives a rather false impression. As you can see from these installation shots, uh, most of the works in the display are small, and being worked on paper, they can't be shown in full light, so they, they are, it would rather have to be a rather dim light. Um, but they're not very well known, so as well as showing something of Jane's friendship network, I hope they uh, give you an opportunity to see works that are not otherwise uh, on display or known about. And in fact, when Jane's daughter, May, who was her eventual heir, died in 1938, her uh, executor did, distributed the possessions, the Morris family's possessions, the artworks, manuscripts, and photographs to the VNA, the British Museum, and the MPG, respectively. So, quite a lot of the small photograph, family photographs that are in the display um, came from James, were originally in James' possession, which is a direct link to the sitter, which is sitters, which is rather nice. They were um, snapshots photographs that she herself had and kept. Um, popularly, Jane is better known for her extramarital affairs, uh, notably, of course, with Dante Gabriel Rossetti, who had first discovered and praised her beauty, which was invisible to the rest of the world. I have to say, she was not deemed to be a beautiful girl by any any, any contemporary standard. Um, her husband, William Morris, drawn here by Fairfax Murray, accepted her relationship with Dante Gabriel Rossetti. Uh, I believe that um, it was at Jane's instigation, and certainly to her delight, that their affair took off in the later 1860s. I would date the beginning of their affair essentially to 1868. Um, and one major result of this was the lease on Chelmsford Manor. Then, a remote, in a remote village, where well it still is in a fairly remote village, and behind the high wall, so it was away from inquisitive eyes, where Jane and Rossetti could be together um, for the summer without too much um, publicity, as it were. And William Morris, <coughs> as he departed for Iceland, first summer 1871. He left Jane and the girls at Kelmstock with Rossetti and he wrote, please dear Janie, be happy. So I think we see Morris generously making Kelmstock Manor a place for Jane to be happy without him. And for a year she was. She sat endlessly for Rossetti and uh, had sonnet after sonnet composed for her, whole sequence that are inspired hugely inspired. Perhaps perhaps one day there'll be a poet in residence at Kelscott Manor because certainly some very, very <laughs> fine sonnets were inspired by it. It was a fairly scandalous episode altogether, of course, but because it was linked to the even worse scandal of the exhumation of Rossetti's poetic manuscript from the coffin of his dead wife, Lizzie Siddle. And that, again, that was in order that he could publish his new poems in praise of Jamie without it being obvious uh, who, they were, who they were to for. And again, that scandal was rather overshadowed Jane's reputation. Now, I believe this tiny, it's really tiny on the left, ink drawing, self-portrait by Rossetti, which is in the display, <coughs> was drawn 
Northern Eye was at the as a potential frontispiece for his first collection of poems, published in 1870, uh, and, it, and as I said, in large part, celebrating his adoration of Jamie, although there were other poems included in it. Uh, sadly for Jane uh, and for Rossetti, their happiness was curtailed two years later by Rossetti's paranoid mental collapse, triggered by some belated bad reviews but I think also by irresolvable inner conflict over his dishonorable conduct in courting and um, loving um, the wife of his close friend and half business partner. At Kelmscott, Jane helped to nurse Rossetti through the worst until she concluded that he was killing himself with overdoses of whiskey and chloral. And then he took those to drown out the hostile voices in his head, which gave him no respite. And the comic self, selfie on the, on the, on the right um, was, I suggest, drawn to amuse Jane, who took to complaining about his gloomy letters. He did write such a nasty letter, she said. Please don't, um, don't write so many like that. Jane's second affair is perhaps explained, if not excused, by, partly by her grief after Rosetti's death in 1882, her continuing grief over Jenny, uh, by William Morris's absorption in political affairs in the 1880s, as he traveled the length of Britain in the socialist cause. He was very seldom at home in the 1880s, in fact, and he was very seldom at Helmscott because of this incessant political campaigning. And I think also, I forget to say, by Jane's susceptibility to flattery. She evidently, um, and the flattery came from this practiced seducer, arabist, and political maverick, Wilfred Scorn Brunt, who also presented himself as a poet and Rossetti's successor in her affections. He got Rosalind Howard to introduce him to Jane with that in mind and added her to his tally of conquests. Um, and Scorn Blunt is drawn here in his romantic Arabist role, role. He bred horses at estates in Sussex and Egypt. And then he became actively involved in the campaign for Irish home rule, which Jane um, also actively supported. She was very passionate in, um, in favor When, when William Morris died in 1896, Jane retained the lease on Kelmscott Manor because they um, didn't, hadn't bought it at all. They had a, an ongoing, a renewing lease. And she retained it as a summer home, partly for her daughters, who thought it the most beautiful house in Lord England, were passionately devoted to Kelmscott, but also, I think, for herself, because she spent, she was the one who spent most time there after Morris's death. She was always endeavoring to spend several of the summer months there because it was effectively uninhabitable in winter, owing partly because there was no heating, but also to the recurrent floods um, when, when the house was sort of marooned. It held memories, of course, of happiness, of the now famous paintings conceived there, like Proserpine on the left, seen in the, in the tapestry room, uh, and a special special photo shoot, as it were, and Pandora on the right, which um, a couple of weeks ago failed to sell at, at Sotheby's, so may still be available if anyone <laughs> has a couple of million, several millions. <laughs> but in, interestingly, in widowhood, Jane didn't wish to be remembered as Rossetti's model of muse, but as Morris's wife and widow. Uh, she promoted Morris's work and legacy through publications, judicious donations, a multi-volume edition of his, uh, of his poetic work, edited <coughs> by her daughter May, with Jane's help, as well as building a pair of cottages in the village in memory of her husband. And she took a fairly active role in village life. At one stage, she wished to, she, she endeavored to set up uh, a, a reading room for the villagers. She, uh, 
was actually rather um, opposed to uh, working class alcoholism, so she wanted to keep the men, the workers of the, in the village out of the pub and thought of a, a, a reading room and with a piano and some musical events would assist in, in, in giving people primitive alternatives. Now the MPD's display includes some rarely seen images of Jane in the tapestry room at the manor. And these are the ones that have never really been, been seen or looked at. Uh, they were probably taken in May 1898, uh, when um, during a very cold and rainy month, perhaps a bit like this one, um, or this week anyway, this was when the tombstone on Morris's grave in the churchyard was um, installed, and their family friend, the photographer Emery Walker, uh, took pictures which were part of the, of, the, of the manor and the village, which were intended for the forthcoming biography of Morris that was published in 1899, written by Bernard Jones's son-in-law. Maybe this sequence, so about six of Jane in, in, in this sequence, was an extra. Maybe it was never intended for publication. I don't know. There's a, there's a kind of fleeting reference to photographs being taken um, in Jane's correspondence for 1898 and, and indeed for the cold, cold weather. And that's why I think she's wrapped in, 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 a, in a mantilla or a shawl uh, because clothes in the manor in a cold time would be, uh, um, a wrapping would be rather necessary. Um, but these, uh, maybe they were never intended for publication, um, and, 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 and that's one reason for the, you can't quite see it on these slides, but with the lack of cropping, they are actually contract prints, essentially, although quite large, and uh, they haven't been cropped or adopted. And at all events, there's only one frame <coughs> that, is, that survives as a print. In another, in, in another collection. Um, so it's a bit of a puzzle. My guess is that Jane thought them too gloomy, too funereal, and did not actually wish for them to be you know, reprinted up and circulated. Um, she looks, I think, older than her 58 years, um, although it's a sign perhaps of the burdens and bereavements and sorrows of her life um, that her hair went white, quite, you know, relatively early age. And <coughs> the images, which is what we have to call them, themselves survived various, several vicissitudes. In the 18, 1960s, they were discovered and rescued with hundreds of Emery Walker's glass negatives that were thrown into a skip in Hammersmith. <laughs> rescued by the wife of the MPG um, director. And then they came to they went to the MPG and they were there were loads and loads of these of these glass slides. There were loads, hundreds and hundreds of them. Um, and they were printed up quickly for record purposes. Which was lucky <laughs> because the negative store where they were where they were held was later the victim of a water leak when the plates for these destroyed. So they glass plates no longer exist, sadly. And these are modern prints from second generation negatives taken uh, in the 1860s. Um, and they're not the only photos of Jane taken at Kelmscott. There are quite a few sort of snapshot, family snapshots as well. But they are the most striking and I think the most poignant Marking her affection for Tom Scott, you need to underline this, Jane commissioned a copy of Rossetti's Water Willow, Rossetti's depiction of herself surrounded by images of the manor, top right, and the river, and the, and the punt, and the church, in the top, sorry, the manor's top left and the church's top right. And this is a copy of the original work, and this is now with Jane's permission from uh, Fairfax Murray and kept at Kelmscott where it now is. And this has been there, it's been moved about as it can. And I'd like to slip in here a contemporary reference to Jane in this period. This 
discovered by one of your fellows, National Portrait Gallery director Sandy Nairn, that he found in a book on the Upper Thames by Fred Thacker, who recalled, and this is the whole thing that's all totally new to me, Fred, this um, topographical artist recalled the great privilege in 1907 of being conducted over the house by Mrs. Morris herself. So I have to go back. by Mrs. Morris herself. <coughs> Tall and erect, clad wholly in white, with soft and cream white hair, she led us with the greatest courtesy through the rooms where the socialist poet and craftsman lived and worked. We saw his faded chintzes and the tapestry of his own weaving, his one picture, which was the Herzl, which not satisfying <coughs> convinced him that he had no message for the world that way. And we saw the wonderful old timbers and the white scoured floors of the attics. The orchard with its gnarled, bent apple trees and ancient turf was as the poet left it 11 years before, and the clipped yews still retained the forms he gave them. The venerable, beautiful lady's ambition indeed had been to preserve everything, even the very species of flowers in the garden beds, as nearly as possible as he was accustomed to see them. So you see the whole tradition preservation of Calcutt Manor, which was actually begun by Jane. And shortly before her death, Jane succeeded in purchasing the manor, and thus securing it for posterity, even though she herself didn't live to, um, to enjoy it as an, as an owner. Um, to secure Jenny's, fut Jenny's future, Morris's estate had been left in trust, and when neither daughter had children, Jane and May determined together their future dispositions, making the Society of Antiquaries the residual legatee. Their first choice had actually been SPAB, but they, they were worried that SPAB would not survive in perpetuity, whereas the Society will. <coughs> and rather surprisingly, it seems to me, perhaps, but it's interesting, that William Morris's legacy has not faded or dwindled away, as so many great so it has risen and fallen over the past century or more. Right now, despite, quite despite the decline in socialist fervor, his name and ideas are enjoying a great resurgence, not least with a whole group of contemporary artists, including Grayson Perry and Jeremy Della, most recently at the Vienna, Vienna, Venice Biennale with Della's mural showing Morris as a giant, pitching the oligarch's yacht into the uh, lagoon. Um, and the fact that Della's English Magic with this work in it is currently on view in Bristol and then will be at Margate in the autumn. And as the first Kelmscott artist in residence, Sasha Ward is another contributor to a different tradition, really, the living art and craft tradition inspired by Morris that complements all the other um, scholarly, conservation, and political activities. So it's really, really very exciting. It should be uh, a working artist, a work artist out there at Kelmscott. Um, and then in October, the next major MPG exhibition, proper exhibition, not a display, Anarchy and Beauty, um, addressing and celebrating Morris's legacy from 1860 to 1960 with Terence Conran in a, a quite Unmorrisian un chair, <laughs> but part of what Fiona McCarthy sees as a, the same tradition. And that will take the story a step further. I have some um, press releases about the up upcoming MPG exhibition, and I very much hope that the Jane Morris display at Kelmscott Manor will prompt visitors to come and see the MPG exhibition.